All right, hey guys. It's been a while since I made one of these, so bear with me if I'm rusty, but here goes. Um, so starting on page six, as you can see, um, I did post notes for all the other answers on pages one through five, so you can just use that if you have any questions. Um, but let's start here. I think this is where most of the confusion fell, so we'll start here. So it says state the domain of each function. So for function f, it's just x squared. Um, ideally, you know the domain of this function because you just have it memorized. You should know that x squared is a parabola that has its vertex at the origin. That's a domain of all reals. Then for g of x, um, this is a radical function. We have the parent function memorized. The parent function um, starts at the origin and then it is sort of um, half of a parabola. Um, it is technically this half of a parabola, but reflected over the line y equals x, so it ends up with this shape. Um, so what's this plus one do? That plus one pulls us one unit left. So um, that would mean that after applying that transformation, you just have this graph. You're starting at negative one and going to the right. So you know that this guy's domain is negative one to infinity with a hard bracket. Um, Finding these domains, I hope, is feeling pretty second nature to you by now. If it isn't, um, you should see me for help. Um, <clears throat> so next, we're supposed to find formulas for each of the following and state the domain of each. Um, I think finding the formulas was pretty obvious. We talked about how you literally do just write the x squared and you add on the root x plus one. And because that can't be simplified, that's it. There's no more to do. We also talked about how the domain of this sum function would be the intersection of these two domains and the intersection of all real numbers and negative one to infinity is the negative one to infinity. If that's not obvious, then again, the way you could puzzle through is to draw yourself a number line. And on that number line, you could show the all real numbers. All real numbers is literally everything. Then you could show the negative one to infinity, that would be negative one to infinity. And you're just thinking, how do these things overlap? And the overlap, of course, would start here at the negative one, and it would run to infinity. And you can see that the stuff that these two sets share would be the entire negative one to infinity. So that's the overlap, okay? Um, so our domain here, is negative one to infinity. And we did also say that um, all of these domains would be the same because all of these domains are the intersection. So whether it's a sum function or a difference function or a product function, they all have a domain that's just equal to the intersection of the original domains. And to write the function rule should be cake two. It'll be x squared minus root x plus one. x squared times root x plus one. All right, the quotient functions are where things get slightly more interesting because now the domains will be the intersection of the domains, but you also have to restrict from the domain any values of x that cause the denominator to be zero. So for this function, f over g, um, does the function g have any zeros? Well, yeah, this function equals zero when x is negative one. So we have that further restriction to our domain. So the intersection of our domains would be negative one to infinity, including the negative one. But now that we have a quotient function and we can't let g be zero, suddenly negative one has to be removed from our domain. And we can do that by just making the hard bracket into soft bracket. So now our domain would be that. Now when f is the denominator, then the zero of function f is zero because x squared equals zero when x is zero. So now if our domain was negative one to infinity, we now need to remove a zero from this interval and zero falls between these values. So that means your best bet here is probably to just make two separate intervals one that goes from negative one to zero, but doesn't include the zero, and then do the union of that with another interval that starts at zero goes to infinity. And that would sort of be the best way to pull a zero out of that 
So now that's our domain for five, okay? Um, I realize I didn't write the function rules, so sure, I'll write the function rules. Um, for f over g, it would be, what, the x squared in the numerator, and the root x plus one uh, in the denominator. And I mentioned in class, we really don't have to clean this up anymore. Radicals in the denominator used to be something you were supposed to get rid of. Nowadays, it's sort of considered acceptable. All right, so five is just the reciprocal of that. It's the root x plus one in the numerator and the x squared in the denominator. So there, there's everything for number one. Um, so now we go to number two on page seven. It says state the domains. Now both of these functions are rational functions and rational functions are always gonna have domains of all real numbers except for any values that make the denominator zero. You can't divide by zero. So for function f, it's all reals except for positive one. And for function g, it's all reals except for um, positive three. Notice that negative two is not a problem in our domain because g of negative two would just be negative two plus two all over negative two minus three which would be zero over negative five. But a zero in the numerator doesn't make us undefined. A zero in the numerator just makes us zero. So negative two is a zero for function g of x, but that zero doesn't need to be restricted from our domain. Unless, of course, you're talking about number four, because number four is a quotient function where we're dividing by g. And so now any value of x that makes the, the denominator function zero, well now it would have to be removed from our domain not because it caused a zero to be in our numerator, but because it's causing a zero to be in the denominator of this quotient function. I uh, hope that made sense. All right, so what are we doing? Find formulas for each and state the domain. Um, so for our sum, we've got the one over x minus one plus uh, x plus two over x minus three and so I made the mistake of spending a pretty good chunk of class time trying to simplify this expression. And I think that is important. You, you are gonna need to know how to simplify this expression. But if you're tuned in just because you're trying to get ready for the check for understanding, that's not something you need to know for the check for understanding. So for that reason, this time around, I might just leave this alone and say, there it is, there's, there's our function rule uh, or our formula. Now let's just find the domain. The domain is still just gonna be the intersection of the two sets. And again, I do think it makes sense to try to visualize these intersections by just looking at them as um, intervals that are sort of superimposed on top of each other on a number line. So all reals except for one would look like this. Go to one, poke a hole. So that's one. So no ones. And then over here, the other one just says no threes. So that interval would look like this, all the way over to three, but no threes. Okay. Um, and so, okay, what would be the answer if I took these guys and superimposed them? Well, if I drag these guys on top of each other, you can see you're gonna still have all real numbers, but you can't be one and you can't be three. So it's just basically, you end up with an interval that has both of those restrictions, not the one, not the three. So our domain would be all reals except for one and three. And of course that would be the same domain for all three of these. And if I'm not super worried about simplifying these expressions, then obviously the difference function would just be this same thing, but with a minus in the middle. The product function would be this same thing, just with a multiplication sign in the middle, okay? Um, I think it behooves us to maybe make a little more room for four and five. And then I can't see the functions. Oops. Dang. 
Okay. So for the quotient functions, um, this is another one that can get a little nasty if we let it. Maybe let's just not let it. Um, so what's going to be the quotient f over g? Well, of course, technically it would be 1 over x minus 1 all over um, x plus 2 over x minus 3. And so this big fraction here, the, when you have a fraction within a fraction, it's called a compound fraction or a complex fraction. Um, and I would say the best way to think about this is this division bar, the one in the middle, that's, well, that's division. So you're basically looking at 1 over x minus 1 divided by um, x plus 2 over x minus 3. And you learned a long time ago that if you have like a 2 thirds divided by a 1 fifth, then your best bet was to do 2 thirds multiplied by 5 over 1. You multiply by the reciprocal instead. So that same wisdom for like numbers, that same wisdom holds for these algebraic expressions too. Just treat this as a 1 over x minus 1 and multiply by the x minus 3 over x plus 2 and then just put those things together. You get the x minus 3 in the numerator and you get an x minus 1 x plus 2 in the denominator. And even if you were trying to give your answer as in, in simplified form, this is the simplified form. You want the bottom factored. You wouldn't foil this out and give, oh, you guys can't see what I'm writing. Uh, almost blew it. Um, you wouldn't give me x squared plus 2 minus 1, so plus x minus 2, x minus 3. Um, this is not simpler. The factored denominator is what's considered simpler. Okay, um, so there you go. Now from this thing, what's our domain? And this is where things got a little hairy. Um, our domain would be our real numbers. And if you're just looking at this rule, you would say it should be our real numbers except for 1 and negative 2. But we actually know that the way this function was defined, it, this function is defined basically as do the f of x, then divide by the g of x. So that means anything not in the domain of f can't be in the domain of this function. And anything not in the domain of g can't be in the domain either. So thinking this through, we do know that 3 is not in the domain of function g. So if we're still letting our domain be the intersection of the two domains, then 3 can't be in our domain, even though this algebraic rule would seem to allow for 3 to be in our domain. But if you think about the way that we're actually evaluating this function, it's we evaluate f, and 3 getting plugged into f is fine. Plugging in 3 would yield 1 half, and that's great. But then we evaluate function g, and when you try to plug 3 into function g, we are undefined. So then at that point, we try to do 1 half divided by a thing that's undefined, and of course we are undefined. So 3 for sure cannot be in our domain. And again, that feels weird, because if you plug 3 into this expression, then what do you get? You get 0 over 2 times 5, and 0 over 10 you would think is just 0, but it's not. Not by the way we've defined our function. So you need to make sure you give me a domain that contains all three of those restrictions. It should have the restriction of um, not being 1 and not being 3, which we got from the um, intersection of the two domains. And we also can't be negative 2, because negative 2 would cause our denominator function to be 0. All right, I said a lot of words there, probably more than I should have, but I hope you understand that. Um, we got to also do 5, g over f. Let's scroll down and do 5. Which was g over f? g over f. Too far. Ugh. All right. So what if our function now is g over f? Um, well, then it would be x plus 2 over x minus 3. Instead of dividing, we just said we should probably multiply by the reciprocal instead. So x minus 1 over 1. 
and that'll get us pretty quickly to an x plus 2 times an x minus 1 with both of those binomials in the numerator. And our denominator is just the x minus 3. So there's our expression. Now, again, if you are not careful, you'd probably fall into a trap of saying that our domain is all reals except for 3. From this algebraic rule, it looks like 3 is the only thing that's bad. But we know that our quotient has to have a domain that is the intersection of the two domains. And that means, again, that since function f is undefined at 1, this function still needs to be undefined at 1. So we can't allow 1 to be in our domain. We can't allow 3 to be in our domain either. The reason why we have no further restrictions on this is because function f in our denominator, this function never equals 0. And it never equals 0 because 0 is its horizontal asymptote. So if I went over to 1, that's my vertical asymptote. But I have a horizontal asymptote at 0. And so that means, if you think it through, that the graph of f of x lives entirely down here, right? Right. Um, so it lives entirely below 0. And then the other branch lives entirely above 0. And so we can see that this function never equals 0. So there are no further restrictions beyond the 1 and 3, which I hope makes sense. There's your domain. Okay, one more thing that I didn't say that I should have said is don't forget that if you are giving me this simplified function rule, this restriction of x equaling 1 not being in our domain, that is not obvious from this function rule. So you are supposed to go up here and actually stipulate that x can't be 1. You have to basically write this note, removing 1 from the domain. Otherwise, 1 would be in our domain, and, and we don't want that. Now, the 3 you don't have to address, because it's obvious that we can't let x be 3, because that causes the regular old division by 0 that everybody knows is not allowed. But if I'm just looking at this algebraic expression, then I feel like 1 is a totally valid input, unless somebody tells me it isn't, which is why. You have to tell me that it isn't. That must be included, or you haven't done it quite right. Moving on. All right. Uh, what? Didn't I already do that? Now I'm confused. 4 and 5. f over g, g over f. Oh, so I already made room? B. Yeah, so these are these are on the thing twice. Great. Okay, so I can skip this page, I guess, because I just talked about it. Um, so how do you find the domain of a sum, difference, or product function? We already said that it's the um, find the intersection of the original domains. And <clears throat> sorry, how do you find the domain of a quotient function? Um, it is still the intersection of the domains. And then I would say with any zeros of the denominator function. removed. So you're jumping through those same hoops of just finding the intersection of the two domains, but then for a function like f over g of x, you also have to run through that rigmarole of finding any values of x that cause g of x to be zero, and then removing those from your domain as well. Homework that I'm skipping, skipping. All right, then there's a quick warm up problem that we kind of already did, but we'll do it again. All right, time to put what we just said into play. What's the domain of function f? Domain of f is zero to infinity. What's the domain of function g? Uh, all reals except one. So what then is the domain of the product function? 
Well, it would just be the intersection of these two sets. And hopefully you get that the intersection of these two sets would be 0 to infinity, but not 1. Because if 1's not allowed in the domain of G, then it's not allowed in the domain of the um, product function. So that would mean it is 0 to 1, union 1, infinity. That would be the intersection of those two. Now, we go to B and we have a quotient function, which means our domain should be the same intersection, the 0 to 1, union 1 to infinity. But we do have that further stipulation that zeros of the denominator are not included. So when does g of x equal 0? Well, this is that same function from before that never equals 0 because 0 is its horizontal asymptote. So that means this function doesn't need any more restrictions because g, function g, never equals 0 anyway. So it will be that same thing. Now if we do this quotient function where f is in the denominator, then we would take our um, intersection, the 0 to 1, union 1 to infinity, and we now need to remove any zeros of function f, and we know that this function, function f, equals 0 when x is 0. So 0 actually can't be in this domain. And we talked about how we can pretty easily lose 0 from this interval by just turning the hard bracket into a soft bracket. So it would suddenly be the interval from 0 to 1 soft bracket, so the open interval from 0 to 1, union um, open interval from 1 to infinity. So there's that warm up. Then we get into something deeper. Um, these functions feel really familiar. 1 over x minus 1, is it the same? Literally the same? 1 over x minus 1 and x plus 2, x minus 3. Yeah, okay, so how is this different? Because um, we're doing composition now and we weren't doing it before? Is that the difference? Yeah, okay, great, fine. So we're using the same functions that we were already talking about, but we were only addressing the more basic function operations of the sum function, the difference, the product, and then the quotient, quotient in both directions, f over g and g over f. So now it's time to talk about the big dogs of composition. Um, so let's do it. Um, just as a reminder, what was the domain of f? Why, of course, it was all rows except for 1. What was the domain of g? It was all reals except for 3. They're asking me, what do I think the domain of f composed with g would be? And so my ignorant, not having learned yet, answer would be, it's the intersection of the two domains. That's going to turn out not to be the case. Um, so since this is just that sort of teacher question of, hey, what do you guys think? Uh, why don't we just leave it blank instead of writing down what we think, which turns out to be wrong. So find a simplified formula. Okay, that we should probably do. I'm just going to pull that up here to make more room for myself. Um, so what's our simplified formula? Um, we're plugging function g into function f. So who's function f? This one. So you would start with 1 over x minus 1. But we know when we're doing function composition, you plug in for the x. And so f of f of g, the thing that we're plugging in for x, is the entire function g of x. So you're grabbing that entire function g of x and you're cramming an x plus 2 over x minus 3. You're plugging that into function f where the x used to be. So now you've got this sort of unholy mess. You've got to clean this up. So this will be 1 over the x plus 2 over x minus 3. And of course, to combine these two terms in the denominator, you need a common denominator. So this 1, you'll rewrite as an x minus 3 over x minus 3. Now you've got a common denominator. So now we can combine to get 1 over. Now, the denominator will be a fraction whose denominator is x minus 3. The numerator will be the x plus 2 minus the x minus 3. So it'll be x plus 2 minus x, and then minus negative 3, so plus 3. So we're here. This will be 1 over. Now we can combine like terms. 
So x minus x is 0. That kind of cancels out. We get 5 over x minus 3. Uh, okay, now um, well my face is in the way. Move face over to there. There you go. Um, so I just said that all this purple stuff became 1 over 5 over x minus 3. And hopefully I don't lose you when I say that if this is 1 over 5 over x minus 3, then that means we, we essentially just have the reciprocal of 5 over x minus 3, which is x minus 3 over 5. Or the other way to think about this is this whole blue thing, right, is just saying 1 divided by 5 over x minus 3, which would become 1 times the reciprocal, x minus 3 over 5, which of course just is x minus 3 over 5. At which point I'd say, hold on, we've got one more thing I would do here. Um, x minus 3 over 5, that's just a linear equation. So this would be like saying 1 fifth times x minus 3 fifths. So that whole composition of functions really just boils down to a linear function. Okay. Um, so we did it. We did the algebra. But... Um, to come up with the domain is tricky because looking at this function rule, you would say that the domain is RL numbers because linear equations always have domains of RL numbers. But we know better than that because we know that to be in the domain of a composition, you certainly first have to be at least in the domain of the inner function. So we know that our domain at best is going to be the domain of G, which is RLs except for 3. So as innocuous as this function rule is, it, it is not supposed to accept threes. Um, it looks like it will accept a three. We know that it won't because we know that the real way that we evaluate this function is by plugging into function g first. And if you plug a three into function g, it fails right away. So that definitely can't be part of our domain. Now the next phase of thinking through our domain is we have to think, hey, are there any restrictions on function f? And of course there are. We know we can't equal one. So then you have to think, does function g of x ever map any x values onto 1? Because if g of x is ever equal to 1, then we'll be trying to plug a 1 into function f, and that'll be undefined. And so those x values can't be in our domain either. And mercifully, the answer is g of x will never equal 1 because 1 is this function's horizontal asymptote. So because g of x never has an output of 1, we don't need any further restrictions. And we can say confidently that just the domain of g is the domain of our composition. I said all this in class today already, so let's move on. You guys can ask about it again tomorrow if you need to. All right. So now they're walking us through some questions. It says... 3 was not in the domain of g of x. Is it in the domain of f of g of x? Use the separate functions f and g to evaluate, not the simplified f of g of x. So remember, the simplified f of g of x was the 1 fifth x plus 3 fifths. Right? Yeah, great. Minus 3 fifths. Minus 3 fifths. Um, so they're telling you, hey, you can't use that, because if you do, um, it might seem like the 3 works. Um, so I already said all this. Um, 3 was not in the domain of g. Is it in the domain of f of g of x? Definitely not, because if you plug in 3 into g of x, then you're definitely undefined. And so then you'll find yourself trying to evaluate f of a thing that's undefined. And of course, you will be undefined. Um, so is it in the domain of this thing? No, period. I don't, I'm not going to extrapolate. Now it says x equals 1 was not in the domain of f of x. Is it in the domain of the composition? Um, this time the answer is yes, because of course, if we try to evaluate f of g of 1, remember the 1 gets plugged into function g first. And plugging in a 1 gives us 1 plus 2 over 1 minus 3, which is 3 over negative 2, which is negative 3 halves. And if you take negative 3 halves now, and plug it into function f, 
that's totally fine because negative three halves is definitely is in the domain of function f of x, so this is defined. I don't feel like doing the math on what that actually equals. Maybe I do. No, I really don't. It would be negative two-fifths. That feels right. I'm going to write that down even if that's wrong. Negative two-fifths. I feel like it's that. But the moral of the story is when I plug in one, I do get back some real valued um, output. So so one is definitely in our domain. So is it in the domain of da-da-da-da-da? Yes. Exclamation point. All right, so what is the domain of this thing? Did the original domain of f or g matter? I, I, I didn't like this question in class. I still don't like it now. The domain of the composition for us right now is just what the domain of g was, which we said was all reals. Oh my god, that's the weirdest. Um, all reals except for three. I don't love this treatment of the question. There's really more to it than I think this question is leading you to believe, but that's okay. Moving on. Okay, now we're supposed to do it the other way. Um, this is the more important question by far. Um, so what's our domain? Again, it's all reals except for one. A little repetitive here. What's the domain? It's all reals except for three. What do you think the domain of the composition will be? Well, I certainly think it'll be at least the domain of f. And then I think it'll be the domain of f, but with any x values that map onto values that are not in the domain of g, removed. That's the sentence you guys need to understand that I think most of you probably don't understand. I'm not writing that down. I don't care what this question says. So C says find a simplified, oh God, okay, sure. Find a simplified formula for g of f of x. This is not easy, but we're plugging f into g this time. That means there's two x's, so we're gonna get all of f of x plus two over all of f of x minus three, meaning one over x minus one. Now we're supposed to clean this up. Okay, so that means if this is over one, I'm multiplying by x minus one over x minus one to get a common denominator. I'll have one over x minus one plus two x minus two over x minus one, all over, uh, one over x minus one, uh, minus three x minus three over x minus one. All right, oh, I don't know if you're with me anymore, but I hope you are. All right, up top, we have a fraction whose denominator is x minus one. Downstairs, we have a fraction whose denominator is x minus one. And we clean up the numerators by just combining like terms. So 2x minus 2 plus 1 is 2x minus 1. Downstairs, we have 1 minus 3x minus minus 3. So this will be negative 3x plus 4. All right, some good news finally is we can actually cancel these x minus 1s. Those do cancel out. And an easy way to imagine doing that is, well, if I multiplied by x minus 1 over x minus 1, then this would distribute in canceling that. This would distribute in canceling that. Um, so they definitely cancel. Now, it seems like I'm ending up with a 2x minus 1 over negative 3x plus 4. This is maybe not the most simple final answer, but I'm just going to live with it for now. That is the function that results. So I guess I should have put that here. Okay, the, the, here's the answer I would have liked. I would factor that negative out of the denominator to get a 3x minus 4. And then just stick that negative on the front of this. And that's sort of the answer I like best. So it's the opposite of this thing. All right, now it's explaining. One was not in the domo in the dom domain of G. Is it in the domain of this thing? Use separate functions, nah, 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 nah. So, no. Not in the domain of G. Wait, what? One was not in the domain of G. Okay, they're playing games on us. 
the amount of f. All right. So one is not in the domain of f. Is it in the domain of g of f of x? That that's a resounding no. No. Because if I were to evaluate, then I'd try to evaluate f of x first. I'd be undefined, and I can't evaluate g. I can't evaluate g at a thing that's undefined. So no. Um, now x equals three is not in the domain of g. That's true. Is it going to be in the domain of this composition? Yes, it will. Because again, if we're doing um, g of f of 3, then pretty obviously, we're not actually evaluating function g at 3. We're evaluating function f at 3 first. So this will be g of whatever function f maps the 3 onto. Plugging in 3 gives us a half. And we can definitely evaluate function g at a half. If that's a half, this will be what? Um, 1 half, 4 halves, 5 halves, over, this is 6 halves. So 1 half minus 6 halves is negative 5 halves. So that's just negative 1. So plugging 3 in definitely gives us a real valued output. So even though 3 is not in the domain of g, it is in the domain of g of f of x. There, I answered that. So what is the domain of g? I think they're jumping to this a little prematurely, but okay. So what is the domain of g of f of x? Well, we just said you have to be in the domain of f of x. So surely our domain, at best, is all reals except for the 1. But now, thinking about the domain of the outer function, g, g will not accept any 3s. So the question is, does f of x ever equal 3? And the easy way to figure that out is just set this equal to the f of x, 1 over x minus 1, and solve this. Cross multiply. 3 times x minus 1 is 3x minus 3. And that equals 1 times 1, which is 1. So 3x equals 4. So x equals 4 thirds. So suddenly, sort of like from out of nowhere, there is this x value that actually is going to be bad and needs to be restricted from our domain. Why isn't that white? Boop. So turns out the x value, 4 thirds, is not in the domain of our composite function. And it's not in our domain because when you plug 4 thirds into f, that's when you get a 3. Then you try to plug 3 into g, and that's when you're undefined. Now the good news is, that's actually kind of obvious from the algebraic rule that we got. Looking at this algebraic rule, we can see that a 4 thirds makes our denominator 0. So it's actually a little easier than you might think to find that restriction is because we can sometimes use the algebraic rule that we get. So that's that. Um, so to find the domain of a composition of functions, I don't know what people are saying here. Um, to find the domain of a composition of functions, find domain of inner function and remove any values of x that map onto values that are not in the domain of the outer function. That could probably be said a little bit better. But let's see how that works. Here's like this is a brand new example, I guess. So how would I attack this? I would start by finding the domain of G. And the domain of G is negative one to infinity. Then 
Um, I would think about the domain of f, which is clearly all reals except for zero. And I'd ask myself, hey, uh, does g of x ever map on to zero? And then what's g of x? It's root x plus one. So does this radical ever equal zero? Um, hopefully you're all screaming, yes, it does at negative one. But the algebra, if you wanted to actually do algebra, you square both sides and you get zero equals x plus one. You subtract one. There's your negative one. So we see that there is a further restriction on our domain where negative one is actually no good. So the domain of f composed with g will actually be negative one to infinity, not including negative one. Okay, that's the end of all the notes I have for now. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful or not. Probably need to post more. I don't have it ready right now, which is fine. How about I just make another video that covers the rest of these pages. Um, okay, see you tomorrow. Bye.